how do you design a living chapel? What does that even mean? The designers couldn't agree, the theologians couldn't agree. We had an impossible task and we had less than one year to build it. Definitely toward, toward the end and we were wondering if we'd make it and we're still welding on pieces as they were loading them in the trucks. The complexity, the design, the shadows, the layers, uh, the metal work was not quite represented in those early drawings. The entire fall semester was spent drawing, modeling, uh, talking, designing, planning, uh, thinking, building mock-ups, exploring potential details. You know, a lot of them want to see what it's going to look like when it's done. They, they, that was a question they always asked. Hey, do you know what it's going to look like when it's going to be done? And, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to see myself. We went back to St. Francis himself, his journey, his chapel. We took four walls of the Porzicola Chapel in Assisi and we opened them up, making them spin around each other. The San Damiano Cross was pivotal for St. Francis's own journey, but we didn't just want to put the cross into the chapel. We wanted to make the cross a part of the chapel. Now you wouldn't just enter the chapel, you would journey into it and you would enter through the cross. St. Francis also had a hedge around his chapel that all of his followers would care for. But instead of the living chapel being surrounded by a hedge, the living chapel would be the hedge. And around this would be planters and seating made from recycled oil barrels. We wanted to use entirely recyclable and repurposed materials. When finished, the structure would measure 45 feet long by 30 feet wide and be up to 15 feet tall. The structure of the chapel was its own design challenge. A lot of protractors, a lot of levels to, you know, maintain the angle. Definitely a lot of, a lot of cutting, a lot of laying out. The chapel would also need to move to multiple locations, starting in central Pennsylvania where it was being built, then to Rome, and eventually to its home in Assisi. It needed to be incredibly strong to support the heavy plants, but it also needed to be light enough to move by hand. So in October, it was decided to switch the project from steel to an aluminum structure. The structure was designed as an enormous jigsaw puzzle, so it could go together and come apart. And in the base of the walls, irrigation tanks provided water for the plants, but also acted as a ballast to help anchor the walls. Three of the walls were covered in plants, but the fourth wall, the music wall, this wall would be different. When you enter into the chapel, it needed to be full of light. It needed to be glorious. To do this, Penn State's team used 1,500 pounds of donated automotive steel scrap to make 94 unique metal screens that look like the fractured panes of a stained glass window. Because the car parts are chaos, yeah. and we just kind of bound the chaos and gave it a direction, and then it, it, they speak for themselves. They also made aluminum ribbons and birds to integrate with the plants on the living walls, and can be added or removed like the plants themselves. This flexibility allows the design of the living chapel to evolve and to change. We also wanted to put music into the chapel. So inside the walls are 42 steel pan drums that were all going to be thrown away as garbage. We wanted to use the water that was irrigating the plants to play the drums as well. But designing this system took months of trial and error. Eventually, they made it happen. Now, by using valves to control the water flow and by changing the mallet heads, the music of the drums can be orchestrated to play a specific tune. This music can be continuously adapted and reimagined, just like the living chapel design itself, it should never be finished. The design is alive, and I think that's the most important thing.